My Gavanan Melanine, and well met indeed. I am Arakia Galadirthan, the head of the modding team behind the submod Divide and Conquer, which is a mod for Medieval 2 Total War, and it turns it to Lord of the Rings. But today, of course, and after some hiatus, we return to what is a series of videos introducing some of the more some more of the lore, rather, to Tolkien's world. Now, as ever, some things to go through beforehand. Number one, none of the images that will be shown on the screen in this video were created by me. And if anybody comes across a video, you, uh, an image you feel um, you have been not shown enough credit, then by all means contact me and um, we can arrange to go forward from there. Uh, secondly, these videos are entirely intended to be listened to and not watched. I have, of course, scoured the internet and got the odd image to back up what I say. There's about 26 images today. Um, some of them have writing on for quotes and whatnot, but it is intended to just be listened to. It is essentially a podcast. Many people have suggested I do them as actual podcasts, but that's a whole new world I don't really know how to venture into. And uh, time for me for me is short. I am a busy gentleman nowadays, um, hence the reason why these are now so few and far between. But rest assured, they will continue. Uh, I believe that's everything out of the way. So. Um, well, a little side note, all of the information that we are going to learn about in this video and the next come from The Silmarillion, Unfinished Tales, and The Book of Lost Tales. Now, The Book of Lost Tales I have as part of the Complete History of Middle-earth, which is a three-tome collection. I use that word correctly, uh, given that each tome of the three volumes has about four or five individual books within it. Uh, and The Fall of Gondolin spoiler alert, is in The Book of Lost Tales, I believe, part two. Um, and much of the information for this informative video comes from those three sources. In fact, all of the information uh, comes from those three sources. I read them on my lunch break at work and I gather the info. So today will be part one of Gondolin, or more accurately, the rise of. And then, of course, part two will be the fall of. Now, that is a great spoiler alert, of course. But any of you that know the history or the uh, of Middle-earth, and indeed Beleriand, you know that all of Beleriand is destroyed at the end of the First Age. And therefore, Gondolin must also follow suit. So, if you're wondering why a map is shown, I like to try and start with maps, because I absolutely love maps. And Gondolin is roughly in the centre to the north, just to the southwest of Tor Nufuin, um, in the mountains there, in a little circular plain. And there lies Gondolin, north of Crisigrim, and to the west of the Pass of Anach. Uh, so Gondolin is the topic for today. But to speak of Gondolin, we must, of course, start with Gondolin's most important person, its founder, Turgon. King Turgon, as he becomes. Turgon is the son of Fingolfin, one of the royal families of the Noldor. And he founded the city. He dis built it, if you will. Now, Gondolin is hidden by its very nature, as we'll discuss much greater in detail as we go forward. And... Turgon was only shown the way to Gondolin by Ulmo, the Lord of Waters, the Valor of the Waters of Middle-earth. And Ulmo assisted Turgon in the creation of Gondolin. Because before Turgon and his people ever make it to Gondolin, they reside in a place called Vinyamar, which you can see just to the west of the map in Nevrast, the region of Nevrast, and Vinyamar is their kind of city, their dwelling, their tower. And this is where the people of Turgon reside. But through the will of Omo, Olmo and through Turgon's desire to build this grand city, they come upon the hidden vale of Gondolin. Now, Gondolin is built very much after a place in Valinor called Tyrion, um, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, and Tyrion is, sits atop a great hill called Tuna. Um, and... Tuna resides in the centre of a plain back in, in um, Amman, where the Noldor have been exiled from. And Tyrion is perhaps one of their greatest cities. And Gondolin is built after this city. But just for the image on the screen at the moment, the, the plain that Gondolin resides on is called Tumladen, which we'll cover a little bit more in a moment as well. That's just a nice sweeping image of it. So... In this, in the what are called the encircling mountains, there is this great vast plain of nothingness. Essentially, it's just green grasslands, trees, forested, whatever. 
Uh, and this is called Tumladen, or this is the name that Turgon gives it, for he finds it first. And in the centre of this great plain lies a single solitary hill, which Turgon names Amun Guareth, which again I will show you in just a moment. So this is the geography of the region of Gondolin, and Tyrion, as I spoke a moment ago, is what Turgon modelled Gondolin after. And there is an artist's depiction of Tyrion. Tyrion, the chief city of the Noldor in Amman, for some considerable time. And Gondolin built after it. So Turgon originally finds the plain of Tumladen and the hill of Amun Gwareth on his own. Olmo guides him through the mountains, through streams underground, and he comes to the plain of Tumladen and he finds this hill, and he just, this is where he wishes to build his grand city. So over time, he secretly has the city built. And... After one of the main battles of Beleriand called the Dagor Aglareb, or the Glorious Battle, this is when Turgon begins to secretly build the city. Now, for the most part, he remains in Nevrast, back on the western coastline, and his peoples build Gondolin. And it takes roughly 52 years, but it is eventually completed and named. And initially, Gondolin is called Ondalinde, which is roughly translates as Stone Song or Song of the... A song of um, the rock, like music of the rocks. It's a, it's a bit of a, bit, it has a few meanings, but it's Quenyan, which is a language, unfortunately, I don't speak. But eventually, Gondolin comes to be known as Gondolin, which is hidden rock in Sindarin. This is the same root word that we see in Gondor, which means land of stone or land of rock. And Gondolin means hidden rock from Gond, again, rock, stone, and Dolan, which means hidden and it becomes Gondolin. And additionally, as I explained earlier, it sits atop a hill called Amun Gwareth, which translates as the Hill of Watching. And Amun Gwareth sits in the centre of the Plain of Tumladen, which means the Open Valley. This is all Sindarin, save for Ondalinde. And this is the name that Gondolin is given, and it is finally constructed, and Turgon moves all of his peoples from Nevrast to Gondolin. His entire society is uplifted and they abandon Vinyamar entirely. But before Turgon finally leaves the city, Olmo comes to him. For they have now spoken at great lengths. <laughs> and Olmo indeed guided him across half of Beleriand to get to Gondolin. But he comes to him just before Turgon makes the final departure from Vinyamar. And he says the following. He says to Turgon, Now thou shalt go at last to Gondolin, Turgon. And I will maintain my power in the Vale of Syrian and in all the waters therein, so that none shall mark thy going, nor shall any find there the hidden entrance against thy will. Longest of all the realms of Eldalia shall Gondolin stand against Melkor. But love not too well the work of thy hands and the devices of thy heart, and remember that the true hope of the Noldor lieth in the west and cometh from the sea. So Olmo very much warns Turgon. He says to him, right, Turgon, now you can go, your city is built, your city is constructed, and long will it stand against Melkor. In fact, long guest shall it stand against Melkor. But remember that the true hope and saviour or saving of the Noldor lies in the west and not in strength of arms or strength of the Noldor or even strength of the walls. And so don't get too attached to the city is essentially what he is saying, which is a bit of an odd one, really, let's be honest. You've just laboured for 52 years to build your grand city where you hope to outlast and build the greatest realm on the face of Middle Earth. And then the gentleman who helped you build the city comes to you and says, we've built this great city, but don't get too attached to it. <laughs> so it's a bit of an odd warning. But Olmo bids Turgon leave behind in Vinyamar a set of arms and armour. A sword, a shield, a hauberk and a helmet. He is commanded to leave behind in the throne room of Vinyamar. Um, and in time this will come back into the story for these pieces of armour are set down and Olmo essentially says to Turgon that when next you see this armour it will be because I have sent it to you. And so the whole of Vinyamar is abandoned and they leave behind this pristine set of their own armour, forged by their hand. Now, the peoples of Gondolin are not purely Noldorine. So, Turgon and his immediate family and his 
immediate followers. They are all Noldor, of the house originally of Finway. But in coming back to Beleriand, they have merged with the Cinder. Or rather, similar to the way that Lothlorien is ruled, the Noldor have arrived and the Sindar have taken them as their lords. Because the Noldor are a higher form, if you will, of elves. As depicted on the screen, elves are broken down into two categories. This is discussed in length in the elf video, elf video I did probably a year and a half ago. But um, there are the Kalaquendi and the Moriquendi. The Kalaquendi means light elves and Moriquendi means dark elves. Contrary to popular belief, this does not mean elves that are good and elves that are bad. It literally means elves that have seen the light of Amman and elves that haven't. Because at the time when the elves first made it to Amman, Arda, the, the plane of existence that Middle-earth resides upon, is lit by two great trees in Amman. Which is also known as Valinor, which is perhaps its more common name. But, um, and these two great trees, upon seeing the light of these trees, elves are kind of uplifted. They are raised above their comrades. And such is the case here. So the Vanyar, the Noldor, and a portion of the Teleri do go to Valinor, and they see the light of these trees, and they become greater than their comrades. Also, partly it could be because they then live with the deities of Arda, the Valar and the Maya. The Valar and the Maya. I hate those words. Because uh, singular and plural sound so similar. Um, and, but then there are those, again, mostly Teleri and, of course, the Avari, who don't see the light of these trees and are thus considered lesser. So the Noldor have returned to Middle-earth, and the peoples of Gondolin are pre predominantly made up of Sindar, which is the second on the list on the right. These are Grey Elves. They are the elves that were, went on the journey, but they stopped in Beleriand, and they made kingdoms there. And Turgon's people is made up predominantly of Sindar over Noldor. So his peoples have now left Vindyamar and Gondolin is now their chief city, where they now reside for a considerable length of time. 350 years they are in Gondolin until anything really happens to them. So their city is expanded, it's upgraded, it's improved, it's forged into the great realm that we know of toward the end of the First Age. But in these 350 years, no one ever finds the city. It should certainly be noted that in its entire history, Gondolin is only ever actually found by very few people, and none of them find it on their own. They all either have guides or they are taken there. And this is the strength of Gondolin. So for 350 years, it grows in size and beauty. Fountains line, its sh line the city streets. A great tower is built in the centre named the Tower of the King. Houses of Gondolin are formed and founded, and I will talk more about those in the second video, part two. But it becomes very much the chief city of the Noldor, it's, without realising it. It is the greatest Noldorine constructed city in Beleriand, arguably, but no one really knows it's even there. Even Turgon's own family don't know where Gondolin is. This is how secret this city is. Now, the, one of the perhaps the greatest jewels of the city are in its central courtyard named many things. We shall call the Courtyard of the King. Two great trees are built to reflect the beauty of the trees of Valinor. Now, in Valinor, they are called Laurelin and Telperion. They have long since been destroyed, or soon they will be destroyed. No, they have long since been destroyed, sorry. And the sun and the moon now light the, the world. But um, in honour of these trees, Turgon constructs two likenesses called Glingal and Belthil and these are one tree of gold and one tree of silver again to reflect the trees of Valinor. But perhaps the greatest beauty in all of Gondolin is Turgon's daughter Idru. Now a brief note about if you are watching the images on the screen there are lots of depictions of Gondolin, many artist interpretations of what the city actually looks like, because we don't have an outrageous amount of detail on the actual layout, the, the how high it was, for example. A lot of people depict Gondolin with as many towers, many, 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 many towers. In my mind, I've always seen it as just a single great tower in the centre. 
I've tried to get images that reflect what I think it would look like. But back to our tale. Turgon's daughter Idril, Idril Celebrindle she is known, and she is perhaps the fairest of all the elves of Gondwan. She was nicknamed as Silverfoot, and she plays a huge part in the history of Gondolin, but for now it is enough to just introduce her. For now we come on to the first part that she has to play in the story, which isn't directly through her, and we come to Maeglin. But to deal with Maeglin, we must first start with Arathel. Now Arathel is the sister of Turgon, she has the black hair that his family has, or dark hair. But she's known as the White Lady of the Noldor for the clothing and raiment that she takes. After this many, many years of utter secrecy, she grows very weary of Gondolin and she desires to leave. Now it should be noted again that in Gondolin there is a very strict rule that none can enter or leave save by leave of the king. And in the 350 years prior to Arathel's desire to leave, no one has ever left. So whilst Gondolin brings safety, security, beauty, it also acts as a prison for those within it to a, an extent. But Arathel Arfainiel, the white lady of the Noldor, oh, she grows very weary and she desires to leave, which she does. Turgon grants her the option to go and she does go. Now she wanders for a while in Beleriand until she eventually comes to the forest of Nan Elmoth, which is just to the east of Doriath, the main Sindar region of Beleriand. And she comes to the small forest of Nan Elmoth. And it is here where our story of Maeglin begins, for in the twisted and dark wood, she comes across one of the few elves expressly described as being a dark elf. And that is Eol. Now Eol, it's a difficult one, for Eol is known as a dark elf. And once again, this is primarily because he doesn't come out in the light. Very much like a vampire. He, he goes about at night time and he lives deep within the bowels of the forest where the sunlight can't really penetrate. But equally, there is a secondary part to Eol, for he is one of the few elves who does very wrong doings, as we shall see in a moment. And so it is possible that the dark elf name of Eol is twofold. First and foremost, again, a literal name in that he prefers the dark. But additionally, there is darkness within him and it comes through in the tale. And the first point of the darkness really is when he first sees Arathel. For Arathel, like almost every elf ever, is incredibly beautiful. And she is one of the elves of the ruling families of the Noldor. She, sister to Turgon, Fingon, and the daughter of Fingolfin, one of the most famous elves of the First Age. And Eol sees her wandering in the forest. She's, she's rather lost. And he is immediately ensnared by her. But he, rather than attempt to win her over, he comes up with a plan to trap her. And this he succeeds in. And Eol manages to win the heart of Arathel against the odds and she stays with him for a considerable length of time in his small little dwelling in the black forest of Nan Elmoth. They even wed and to the two of them is born Maeglin. Maeglin, I say his name with such... with, with, with such fear and regret really as you'll see as we go on. Another aspect of Eol which shapes part of the story is he is not a Noldor, he is a Sindar elf, but he is shunned by his kin and he absolutely hates the Noldor. So it's quite an interesting twist that he does marry Arathel and has a child with her because he can't stand the Noldor and he blames the Noldor for the problems that Beleriand faces. Because remember that long before the Noldor returned to Beleriand, in all the years before that, Melkor is in Valinor and Beleriand is a land of total peace. There are no wars, there are no enemies. Melkor is either chained in Valinor or then he's eventually freed. He's then in Valinor for a considerable length of time longer and it isn't until he steals the Silmaril, destroys the trees and flees that the problems come to Beleriand. And Eol places the blame of Melkor's coming at the feet of the Noldor. He has no love for them whatsoever. And Maeglin, like his father, 
gains some of this distrust, but he also gains the heart of Eol, the ability to see darkness over light, essentially. Maeglin isn't inherently bad, but he's more open to bad choices than perhaps any other elves are. But Eol and Meglin are both very, very skilled, almost to the level of the Noldor. Now, of course, Meglin is part Noldor, part Sindar, but Eol is fully Sindar. Um, and Meglin quickly eclipses his father in skill owing to his Noldor heritage, for they are renowned craftsmen. The difference, a large difference between the two, though, is Meglin rarely ever spoke. He has a sort of brooding... Um, <laughs> allure to him in that he never really speaks unless he absolutely feels a need to. Um, so he's quite a, a an odd child, if you will. Now over their years together, uh, there's an image of Maeglin, sorry. Over their years together, Arathel tells stories of her homeland. She tells stories of Gondolin, her brother, and the wonders of the city and the plain of Tumladen. And Maeglin and, and Arathel both then gain a longing to leave this forest prison they are entrapped in and return to Gondolin. But Eol will have absolutely none of it. And he forbids them to leave. But then rather foolishly, he accepts the invitation of the dwarves of Belagost to attend a feast for one of their celebrations. And he accepts this and he rides off to the Blue Mountains. Because Eol is in very close friendship with the dwarves. He is the most dwarven... Or arguably, he's a very dwarven elf. He prefers the darkness. He prefers craftsmanship and smithing, much like the Noldor. But he's closer to the dwarves than he is to the elves in terms of friendship. And over the years, with Arathel telling the stories to Maeglin, Arathel and Maeglin both become quite estranged from Eol, to the point where you could arguably say Arathel no longer loves Eol, which is really rare for the elves. Now, it's never said that especially, that is my pure conjecture. Take that as conjecture. But it would certainly fit the pattern that Arathel falls out of love with Eol, which, as I say, for elves is unheard of. They, like swans, mate for life. But Arathel and Meglin desire to leave, and when Eol goes to the Blue Mountains for the feast, they flee. They abandon Nan Elmoth and they head back to Gondolin. But by happenstance, Eol returns from the Blue Mountains early, and he is but a few days behind their departure. And he follows them and chases them down. Now, of course, Arathel having come already from Gondolin, she knows the way back. So she doesn't need any guide and she doesn't need anyone to tell her how to get there. She just retraces her steps and she takes Maeglin back and they have to pass through the same system that we will discuss in a little while. And for it's more relevant a little later on, but they are followed all the way by Eol and by. But he is very quickly found for the entrance to Gondolin is protected by seven great gates, as I'll discuss later. And whilst Arathel and Maeglin pass through when they see that she is the sister of the king, Eol is not as lucky and he is brought before them as a prisoner. But Arathel ensures that he doesn't get killed at the gates, and instead is brought before Turgon. Now, Turgon welcomes him as a brother, for he is now his brother-in-law, and Turgon extends the hand of peace to Eol, and it is rejected. In the court of the king in Gondolin, Eol cries out to all the Noldor in earshot, and he blames them for all of the problems of Beleriand, and he wants nothing to do with any of this. He wants to take his son, maybe not his wife any longer, but certainly his son, and he wants to just go back to Nan Elmoth and leave this all behind. He wants nothing to do with the Noldor. But Turgon, in a stern voice, stands and corrects him and says, But by the swords of the Noldor is your little forest protected. If we were not here defending you against Morgoth, you would be in thraldom working as a slave in whatever manner of devices Morgoth can conjure up to make your life hell. You should be welcoming us and helping us, not scorning us. And he gives Eol a choice. He says, under our laws and by our laws, but because you are kin, I will repent the usual law that whoever comes to Gondolin cannot leave. This is the standard rule, but it's broken quite a lot, to be honest. But um, he says, because you are kin, I will give you this choice. You can either leave now alone and we will never speak of this again, or you will die here. And Eol gravely thinks upon this for a long time, staring Turgon in the eye until eventually, hidden from his cloak, he pulls a weapon. For in this choice that Turgon has given Eol, 
Turgon also gives this choice to Maeglin. And he says you can he says to Turgon, you can either flee now and leave, or you will die here, for none leave once they've decided to stay. And this choice I also give to Maeglin. And Turgon pulls the weapon from his cloak, a hidden javelin apparently, to, uh, Tolkien writes, and he launches it at Maeglin, crying, The second choice I take, and for my son also, you shall not hold what is mine. And before the javelin can pierce any part of Maeglin, Arathel dives in the way and is struck. Now she doesn't die instantly, but unbeknownst to many of the healers of Gondolin, the weapon was poisoned and she dies that evening. Now, Turgon was originally furious. Obviously, he, he enslaves Eol, he imprisons Eol, and for that first part of the day when Arathel is still alive, she counsels Turgon to be lenient. Don't kill Eol, because at the moment no one knows that Arathel's going to die. They don't know about the poison. She's just been hit in the arm with a javelin, basically. So they, take the, they heal the wound up, patch it up, no problem. No one knows she's slowly dying. And she counsels Turgon, she says, don't kill Eol. Um, just just send him away. But then in the evening, of course, she does die from the poison that none of them knew of, and Turgon's mind is made up. And in one of the most interesting stories, I think, an elven execution takes place. Eol is brought to a place called the Karagdur, and this is a great precipice off the walls of Gondolin. It is quite literally a... A, a plank aboard a pirate ship, if you will, but off the top of, a, of the walls of Gondolin, a sheer drop to the base of Amun Gwareth and the rocks below. And Eol is brought to the precipice, and he's there to be judged. Now, before he can... Before he is thrown off the edge, he cries out to Maeglin, his son, and he says, So you forsake your father and his kin, ill-gotten son. And he cries, here shall you fail of all your hopes, and here may you yet die the same death as I. And then Eol is tossed off the walls of Gondolin to his death, which is grim. The elves, there are very few stories of the elves killing each other in, a, in an execution style manner. And it, it's just fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And he is thrown from the walls of Gondolin where, and he falls to his death at the bottom. Now, it's worth noting that Maeglin, upon hearing his father cry this out, he is unmoved. His love for his father now is very, very small. And he is barely touched by the passing of both his father. Or by, by the passing of his father. But he is very distraught at the passing of his mother. Now, the darkness in Maeglin's heart begins to foster itself and grow stronger through an ill-fated love. For as already discussed, the daughter of Turgon, Idril Celebrindel, is one of the most beautiful beings in all of Beleriand, and Maeglin falls in love with her. However, the keen amongst you will note that they are cousins, first cousins in fact, and in Tolkien's mythology and indeed in elven culture, this is shunned. First cousins do not wed. But Maeglin falls in love with Idril, and much to his distaste and hatred and pain, she cannot stand him. It isn't just a case of she doesn't even know he's in love with her, it's a case that he, she really does not like him. And she even is very wary and cautious around him, for she fears he may have the same darkness that his father had. And this is the first sort of seed of real blackness in Maeglin's heart as love for Idril slowly burns within him and turns into something worse when he realises over time she's never going to feel that back. But then some years pass and Maeglin grows in great prominence in the city of Gondolin. He is a very skilled craftsman and he rises to become the head of the House of the Mole, one of the 12 houses of Gondolin. And he is essentially the chief architect and builder of the elves of Gondolin. And he becomes very high in the council of the king, for Turgon almost loves Maeglin as a son. Um, and Maeglin becomes really well-renowned and loved by all the people of Gondolin, which only makes it all the more painful for him that the one person he wants to return his love hates him. Now, Maeglin has some predispositions towards certain races, and unlike his father, he doesn't hate the Noldor, but some a race that he does distrust are humans. 
And the tale then takes us to the first coming of men to Gondolin in the brothers Huor and Hurin. Now, Huor and Hurin, I believe, are of the house of Hador? Ha- Hal? Uh, Guador? I've not researched that bit, that's why I'm guessing. Uh, but they are they are leaders of the um, men of Dor Lomin, which is a region of Beleriand where um, a sect of humans have, have resided. For the men that come to Beleriand are then broken down much in the same way that the elves have the three houses, the Vanyar, the Noldor, the Teleri. Uh, men have that same sort of distinction and each have their separate lords, separate families. And Huor and Hurin are lords of the men of Dor Lomin. And they are brothers. Now they are brought to Gondolin because for reasons... Um, they become lost for reasons. <laughs> That's terrible. They become lost in the area to the west of Gondolin. And for fear that they may be killed by orc raiding parties or, or orcs just roaming the land, the eagles, who are ever watchful of Gondolin, bring Huor and Hurin to the city. Now, this is a little bit where we can depart and just say that the eagles are fiercely defensive of Gondolin for reasons that are never really explained, other than their eyries are in this part of the mountains, so their homes are here, so it's in their interest to keep this land safe, but they defend Gondolin to an extent that that's never really dealt with. Manway never directs that they should defend this city, they just take it upon themselves to defend it. And any orc that ever comes within range of the mountains is instantly put down by the eagles in an attempt to ensure the secrecy of Gondolin. Uh, but they bring Huor and Hurin to the city. And they reside there for some time, because like all peoples that come to the city, Turgon essentially says, now you've found us, you can't go away. You're going to have to stay here forever. And they kind of just get on with this for, the, for a while, and a great love actually grows between Turgon and these brothers. And they become great friends. And this is another aspect that brings jealousy to Meglin, seeing this love for his now kind of a foster father and these humans who he sees as less than elves. If it grows, another hatred grows in his heart, another string to the bow of his darkness. Now, after a while, it's only a, it's only a few years, I think it may even be a year, the brothers are actually allowed to leave Gondolin. And they, because they petition the king and they say, look, the time really has come that we should get, we should go. Everyone will be wondering where we are we, and we can't do anything here. Our families and our lives are elsewhere. And they do say that by your rule, anybody that finds the way to Gondolin cannot re leave because they know the way. They could tell someone else and our secret is undone. But they say, but hang on, we didn't find the way. We were brought here by eagles. We have no idea where this city is. We, we were flown over mountains for, for, for ages. Like, we have not got a clue where we are at the moment. And we can go back the exact same way because Turgon is very friendly with Thorondor, who is the king of the eagles. And um, Thorondor agrees to fly the brothers back. So Huor, Huor and Hurin leave the city, but they become the first humans to have found the city. And their stories, and more importantly, their sons, have a very interwoven story with Gondolin, as we shall see. Now, some years pass again, and Gondolin next enters into the stories of Beleriand with perhaps the saddest of the tales of Beleriand, the Nerneith Arnoidiad. Now, for those of you who are unsure, the Nerneith Arnoidiad is the battle of unnumbered tears, and it is an unbelievable loss for the free peoples of Beleriand against Morgoth. He destroys what was a lengthy siege on his citadel, and he wipes out thousands. It's it's, it's not even worth thinking about how many of the forces of good die in the Battle of the Neneith Anodiad. But I will give it its own video, so we won't discuss the battle too much in detail here, but just Gondolin's part in the battle. So the armies of what is Hithlum, which you can't see the full word of, but it's away to the um, west there. The plan for the Battle of the Neneith Anodiad is that the Sons of Fionor, as discussed in the Fionor video, are going to attack the plain of Amphauglith, which is in the north, and... They're going to destroy the armies of Melkor in a twofold plan, where the eastern side of Anfauglith, the armies of the Sons of Fionor, combined with the dwarves and with the contingency of men that live on the eastern side of Beleriand, they will attack. Melkor will see this army, he'll, he'll, he'll move his army to attack, and then 
a trap will be sprung where armies of Hithlum and the western side of Beleriand will pass up the river Syrian, which just runs through um, this little river just up here toward the Fen of Serek. And they'll pass through the Fen of Serek and they'll attack on the western side. So a hammer and anvil kind of attack. Melkor will be utterly ruined. We'll finally have won the day. We can get the Silmaril back and end the curse upon our family. Because the plan is conjured up by Meathros, the son of Fëanor. But... Meathros does not know that part of the humans who are fighting with him have already sided with Melkor and they will betray the armies of the Nernaeth Arnerdiad, which is one of the triggering events and why the battle is such a great loss. And they are delayed in their attack on Melkor. So the armies in the west are just waiting. They're all hidden around the hills. Their army is not known. Melkor can't see it. He's got no scouts knowing that it's there, but he's kind of suspecting they might attack, but he can't see anything. And the army on the east doesn't attack when it's supposed to. So the army on the, est on the west is waiting. And they're all, as I say, led around the river Syria. Now the human contingents, contingent on the western side is led by Huor and Hurin, the brothers who recently visited Gondolin. But also leading the western army is the high king of the Noldor in exile, Fingon, who happens to be Turgon's brother. Now, Gondolin has not played a part in any war up until this point, and the Nerneath Arnodiad, I think, is the fourth battle of Beleriand, or possibly the fifth. So, it's been a while, and they haven't fought, and no one really knows anything about them, but Gondolin's strength at this point is vast, and unchecked, unlooked for, from the, the mm, filling out from the mountains, from places where people don't even know, Turgon's army comes. Horns sound and 10,000 strong of Gondolin come down from the mountains and stand side by side with King Fingon. Now Fingon doesn't even know where Gondolin is. Um, he probably hasn't seen Turgon now for some time. So of course great pleasure is had at the coming of the 10,000 of Gondolin. But Fingon puts Gondolin's army at the rear of the Western army. So they are going to guard the rear. They're going to be the backup. They're going to... Because they... The plan didn't even include these 10,000 strong. So he wants to separate them and call them in if they need to. Now, the plan goes awry, as I will discuss in the Nerneath video. And the battle is joined on Melkor's terms and not on the free people's terms. And this is the first event of why the battle turns into a great loss. But Turgon's army is held in the rear and Fingon and the men of Dor Lomin, they attack the forces of Melkor on the west and a bloody battle ensues. Now Melkor suckers the western army into a trap and the forward force of King Fingon and Huor and Hurin is outnumbered and surrounded. And Turgon then takes it upon himself to decide to support his brother and he moves his army up. And he pushes with his army through the lines of the orcs and he makes it to stand side by side with his brother Fingon. But Gothmog, this video has a lot of buts, doesn't it? Gothmog, the chief and lord of all Balrogs forces his own force in between the now two armies, Fingon and the men of Dor Lomin and Turgon. Uh, no, sorry, Fingon and his elves are now separated from Turgon, the men of Gondolin and the men of Dor Lomin, or the elves of Gondolin and the men of Dor Lomin. And Fingon is slain by Gothmog. Turgon, from afar, unable to do anything, sees his brother die at the hands of the Lord of the Balrogs. But he, Huor and Hurin and their armies are still fighting on. They're still holding on. Now, brief side note for you. The gentleman on the left in that image is Glorfindel, the lord of the House of the Golden Flower and perhaps one of the finest and greatest elves of, of all of Middle-earth. Um, you may know him from The Fellowship of the Ring where he's also in that book. Anyway, by the by. So Turgon is now fighting to the death with Huor and Hurin for other reasons that will become clear in the following video. The battle is now going awry. The plan has failed utterly. The Eastern army is almost... is No one really knows what's happened with that, but it's at this point it's scattered or scattering. And Turgon, Huor and Hurin and their armies are making a last stand on the west. And Melkor throws everything he has at the army. And Huor and Hurin come to Turgon. And a discourse is had. Then Hurin spoke to Turgon saying, Go now, Lord, while time is, for in you lives the last hope of the Eldor. 
Eldar, and while Gondolin stands, Morgoth shall still know fear in his heart. But Turgon answers, not long now can Gondolin be hidden, and in being discovered it must fall. But then Huor speaks, and he says, Yet if it stands but a little while, then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men. This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death. Though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again, from you and from me a new star shall arise. Farewell. So Hurin tells the Lord that he must go. He must leave. Gondolin is now the only thing that Melkor will fear, because he still doesn't know where it is. But Turgon says, but if Gondolin, Gondolin's not going to be hidden for long now with the armies utterly destroyed, the forces of Melkor can enter Beleriand proper, Gondolin will be found, and as soon as it's found, it will fall. No one can come to our aid. But then Huor says, ah, yes, and he prophesizes thus that Gondolin needs to stand because from adjoining of their houses, a new star shall arise and hope for elves and men will be born. So Turgon begins to flee. The men of Dor Lomin guard, their, guard the elves as they back away. They need to ensure that no one knows where the elves go so Gondolin can remain hidden. And the men of Dor Lomin make a famous last stand. An outrageously famous last stand, in fact, as will be covered in the other battle. And many, many times, for those of you in the know, the words Aure and Tulava are heard as Shurin stands alone as the final man of Dor Lomin, defending the elves as they back away. Huor is slain at the last stand of the men of Dor Lomin, by the way. And Hurin is taken prisoner. Very famously, actually. But um, Turgon manages to escape, and ensuring that the elves do get away and no one knows where they go, Glorfindel and Ecthelion, the two greatest captains of the army of Gondolin, also stay back a bit to defend the army as it flees, and they are the last to pull away. And the army successfully escapes without the orcs knowing where they've gone. Now, it's also worth noting that Turgon now at this point becomes the High King of all the Noldor in exile, for it passes on to him. So not only now is he the king of the only bastion that will be able to stand against Morgoth, but he is also the High King of all the Noldor in exile. He's not the High King of the Noldor that stayed in Valinor, um, for I believe his uncle holds that um, accolade. But it is right, Hur Hurin speaks the truth and Morgoth fears Gondolin. He had no idea this great city existed and 10,000 warriors appear out of nowhere to fight against him. And if he hadn't played, laid some pretty clever plans, the Nenaeth Arnurdiad would have been a massive loss the other way around. And Morgoth may well have lost. But the line of Finn Golfin which is now passed, as I say, to Turgon, stands against Morgoth to the bitter end with the final High King of the Noldor, who is Gilgalad. Again, spoiler alert. But now we come on to the final play in the story of Gondolin before, uh, for this video, we come to Tuor. Now, Tuor was the son of Huor, who we've just spoken of, who died at the Battle of the Nerneth Arnerdiad, and was the brother of Hurin. And Tuor was his son. Now, Tuor was born after the N.A., which is what I shall call the Nerneth Arnerdiad, and so Huor never met him. And Huor, for a time, he lives a very troubled youth, um, which we shall say to keep the video a reasonable length. And he's enslaved for a period of time, then he breaks free, and and he eventually makes his way out. Now, Olmo chooses Tuor as the instrument of his prophecy some years before. We're now looking at about 480-ish, I believe, somewhere around their years since the founding of Gondolin and Olmo came to Turgon. So a very, very long time ago. And Olmo chooses Tuor as his champion. And he instructs and lays plans that Tuor makes for the city of Vinyamar in Nevrast. Whereupon Tuor finds the armour that was left there by Turgon some 500, we'll call it, years ago. So armed and out, well, arrayed in the arms and armour of Gondolin, or what was Vinyamar, Tuor, standing upon the edge of the sea, Olmo comes to before him, as is depicted in this image and many other images. It's very... It's a particular favourite of artists to depict the Olmo coming before Tuor. Now, he doesn't say anything grand or anything. Olmo just bids that he seek for Gondolin. And he gives him a cloak that will sh shield him from enemy eyes. 
um, a semi-invisibility cloak, if you will, but more akin to the elven raiment, where if you don't want someone to see you, they won't see you kind of thing. Now, on his way seeking for this hidden city that he did not even know existed, Tuor comes upon an elf called Veronwe. Now, Veronwe is Turgon's answer to Olmo's initial warning. You'll remember that Olmo said that the the hope of the Noldor lies in the west, coming from the sea. And so Turgon, at one of the peaks of Gondolin's power, he sends, when he fears that the elves aren't going to be able to defeat Morgoth, he sends a number of emissaries to sail west. They, they leave Gondolin, they head to the sea, they get ships, and they sail west to try and ask the forces of Valinor for aid. And only Veronwe of the number that he sends, I think it's around 10 maybe, I'm guessing. It's a reasonable enough number, but anyway, Veronwe is the only elf that survives. And he only survives because Olmo saves him. And he brings him to the shore, whereupon Tuor comes upon him. All part of Olmo's plan, you see, because Tuor does not know how to get to Gondolin, but Veronwe does. So together, Veronwe and Tuor make their way for Gondolin. And Veronwe guides him there, and they come upon the Seven Gates. Now, I thank whoever drew this, because it's a bloody marvellous representation, so um, you don't have to just try and think it all in your head. Now, this is a little bit of info about Gondolin's kind of structure, if you will, and it plays a part in Tuor's story. And these are the Great Gates of Gondolin. So the pass, the main path into Gondolin, is called the Orfalch Echor Kirith Niniach. Um, and this is a, a kind of underground road, almost, that makes its way from the plains of Beleriand up to the hidden valley of Tumladen. Because remember, Tumladen is raised above the ground quite substantially. So this is quite a steep um, path that runs through the mountains. And this is the main entrance into Gondolin. And barring the way are seven gates. Each gate is guarded by... There's a captain at the gate. Not all of their names are provided. And... There's different architecture designs, and even the warriors at each gate wear different armors reflective of the gate. It's all very ornate and very um, fancy. But the first gate that Tuor and Veronwe come to is called the Wooden Gate. Now, this is a very simple wooden portcullis. It's the image in the top left. It's basically the stone makes the wall, so the rock of the mountain itself makes the wall, and the portcullis just covers the gap. And this is the first gate. The second gate is called the Gate of Stone. And this is a single stone door that has no obvious hinges. Um, and when Tuor sees it open, he marvels at this elven construct. So he passes through the first gate and the second gate. Now, brief interlude, he passes through all of these gates as a prisoner. Because Tuor is a man... And at the moment, Gondolin is basically under lockdown. No one can come. But Tuor obviously is outfitted in the raiment of Vinyamar. And all of the, many of these elves will, have, will know exactly what that armour is. Uh, but also he speaks with an authority that the gatekeeper, who's called Elemakil, or Elemakil, sorry. Elemakil is swayed by the power and authority in Tuor's voice and he agrees to lead him to Turgon. Because Tuor basically says, I have a message from Olmo, I will only speak to the king. Which could some people would could laugh off, but these people see that he speaks the truth and they're willing to take him at least to the king for judgement, rather than kill him outright. And then he comes to the third gate, the Gate of Bronze. Now this is the first one that's um, or the, a real proper wall, and the gate itself is made of bronze, but the towers above the gate are also made of bronze, and by some form of elven trickery, they glimmer and they shine as if the sun is reflecting off them, even though we're deep under the mountains. There's no natural light down here. So elven trickery. And then they come to the fourth gate, the Gate of Riven Iron. Now this is a high and black wall, uh, ominous in the void, and it has no lamps upon it. Uh, and in the centre of the above the gate is a great statue of Thorondor, King of Eagles. And it kind of claws down over anyone passing through the gate. And the gate itself though, even though it's made of iron, it's actually really intricately designed and it looks like a forest. It looks like trees and flowers, plants, all growing up, making the gate itself. 
And so it's a real marvellous beauty, if you will, even though it's made of iron. So they pass the fourth gate, and then they come to the fifth gate, the Gate of Silver. Also Gate of the Moon or the Gate of Telperion, for this gate is built reflective of the moon and of Telperion, the tree that once was the moon, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> that's not directly true, that's a massive simplification, but that's kind of the point of the video. Now this gate was built of white marble, the wall itself was built of marble, and the gate itself was as an orb, as you can see in the image, it looks like the moon. But it had silver trellising going across the top of the gate and the, there were archers that defended this gate and they were robed all in white. It's a very white slash silver themed gate. <laughs> the gate itself was actually made in three parts so rather than just a standard opening and closing or raising and lowering it kind of like parted into the wall as a three way gate. And above the gate in the centre stood a likeness of Telperion, the great tree of Valinor, wrought of silver and malachite. And it had flowers that were made of pearls. And there were two hundred archers standing, a hundred on either side, along the road behind the gate. They had great white crested helms. And they defended the gate as its first defence. Now as the road passed between the fifth and the sixth gate, small flowers began to bloom on the sides of the road because grass began to grow and these flowers are known as Wilos, uh, which kind of means ever or ne never ending everlasting and they gl they glow a beautiful white silvery color and Tuor describes this as stars amongst the darkness it looks like the, the heavens are on the ground around you now as they came closer and closer to the sixth gate golden flowers also joined these silver ones on the sides of the road to create an image of utter beauty and indeed the sixth gate is called the golden gate and is named after either the sun or laurelin which is the which was the tree that acted as the sun beforehand and this is identical to the silver gate except anything that was silver is now gold and there's laurelin instead of telperion above the gate now the guards here were arrayed in gold, but they had red shields, big red shields. And it was very much a sun related gate. And then finally, the seventh gate was a new addition built by Meglin after the Nanerth Arnoediad. And this is called the Gate of Steel. Now this gate had no obvious actual gate and it didn't have a stone wall or a big wall or anything. It was a huge steel fence, very much as the image depicts with two towers either side. And it had, crossed, it had bars crossing between the towers along with a fence. So it was a wall, but it was more fence-like than a wall. Now, Tua saw no actual way through this. Uh, he didn't really understand how they would get through. Uh, but Elamakil uh, touched upon the fence and it rang as if a harp was playing. The, the very fence itself made a melody as it was touched by the guard. And Ecthelion, Lord of the Fountain, came riding from one of the towers and stood before Tuor. Ecthelion was clad all in silver and white. Now Tuor spoke with him and said he had to go through. And Ecthelion allows this. And when Ecthelion touches the fence, it parts as one great gate. Now the adornment of the seventh gate was in the centre at the very top. Um, well, on, on the top of the fence, there were seven pillars that rose to needle-sharp points. But on the central one was a representation of the crown of... or the crown helmet of Gondolin. A sort of battle helmet worn only by the king. And there was a representation of that above the gate. So Ecthelion and Tuor pass through the gate. And... Tuor sees for the first time Gondolin. Now this image, side note, is the image of Gondolin I have always in my head and the one that I think rings most true um, for, and it just looks so good, doesn't it? With the Tower of the King in the centre. So Tuor is led before Turgon and he relays a message to him from Olmo and he bids that the elves leave Gondolin. He says, now is the time to leave. Olmo's message to you long ago, now is the time. If you stay here, there is only doom before you. He also explains that the doom of Mandos is almost fulfilled. The doom that says that the Noldor will basically perish if they follow the errands of the sons of Fionor. But Turgon had become quite proud and he, he did feel that Gondolin would stand, they would be strong. 
And also, he ever had the Council of Merglin in his ear telling him, I'm not sure if this gentleman's correct. I think we're going to be all right. You know how strong our walls are. You know how hidden we are. How are we ever going to be found? Now, part of this is because Merglin almost immediately distrusts Chua, and he holds him in distaste. Which causes another great rift between them, for Chua stays in Gondolin for quite some time. And... Of course, Meglin is in love with Idril, who who doesn't like Meglin at all. She can't stand him. And to rub salt into that wound, Meglin doesn't like Chuor either. And Chuor and Idril, after seven years of Chuor staying in Gondolin, they wed. One of the few times elves and men come together. And as prophesied by Huor, the houses of Huor and Turgon join together through their children. And after a while, after they have wedded, born to both of them is Eärendil. And now Eärendil comes into the story a great deal more. And this is the 503rd year of the founding of Gondolin. Eärendil is born. And the story today now ends. For the birth of Eärendil marks the starting events of the downfall of Gondolin. Now it should be noted a few minor points before we depart that upon the arrival of Chua and his warning to Gondolin, Turgon has the entrances to Gondolin sealed shut and by that I mean like landslide shield, sealed shut. So the possibly destruction of the gates in, to entail this but he ensures that the entrance way, the Orfalk Echor, the starting path is closed completely in an attempt to seal Gondolin in. Now, Mor Morgoth ever probes for Gondolin, and he desperately tries to find it, but he never can. The eagles ensure that none of the orcs ever get near to Gondolin, because of course at this point, well not necessarily of course, but at this point Gondolin stands as one of the few remaining bastions of the free peoples in Beleriand. Morgoth is winning almost everywhere else. Beleriand is falling to his power. But the orcs never come near the encircling mountains, for the eagles kill them. They defend the mountains themselves. Until, after a while, and the final point of our story today, Hurin, who was captured at the Battle of the Nerneath Arnerdiad some years before, he is eventually set free by Morgoth. After he, the story of Hurin, when he is captured and taken back to Morgoth, Morgoth tries to get as much information out of him as he can and Hurin gives nothing up. He is tortured relentlessly and he gives nothing up. And Morgoth punishes him by strapping him to a throne atop the mountains, the Thangorodrim. And he gives him the sight and ears of Morgoth himself. So Hurin is trapped on this chair that he can't leave, but he can see and hear everything that happens in Beleriand. And he is forced to watch the story of his children as it unfolds. The Nan I Hin Hurin the lay of the children of Hurin. For his children come under great hardship and sorrow, and Hurin is forced to watch. And when that story comes to an end, Morgoth says, it is basically now worse if I actually let you go and wander the land that you once called home and in your misery. So I'm going to do that. So Morgoth lets him go. And Hurin heads south and tries to come to Gondolin because he knows sort of roughly in the world where it is. And he comes to a point near the encircling mountains where he thinks Gondolin is and he cries out to Turgon and he says, Turgon, bring me to your city. Like It's the only place of peace left to me. I, I really want to come back. And Turgon doesn't answer him and the eagles don't answer him. And Hurin curses Turgon and cries out aloud at the, the fall of the Noldor. But unbeknownst to him, he's being watched by orcs the whole time. And the mere fact that he stands upon the western edge of the encircling mountains, faces east and cries out for Gondolin, the orcs report that back. And Melkor finally understands where roughly in Middle-earth Gondolin is. Or Beleriand, sorry. So the tale of Gondolin, the downfall is in parts. Meglin, the seed of jealousy within the walls itself, Hurin giving away the general overview of where Gondolin is. And of course, Morgoth utterly surrounding Gondolin by destroying the realms of Doriath, Nargothrond and Menegroth and pushing the elves to the sea. But the fall of Gondolin is for the second video. And for today, that concludes. Now, it's been a very long time since I've done one of these, so I hope I've done it justice. I know I ramble. 
That is for true. These aren't to everyone's taste and I appreciate that. If I've said anything incorrectly, it's probably because I didn't write that bit down and I'm trying to go off the top of my head and I couldn't remember. <laughs> I was very worried I was going to call Thorondor Thorongil, which I believe is the name Aragorn takes when he um, attacks Umbar and assists Denethor long before the uh, events of the War of the Ring. And I was really concerned I was going to call him that. But um, I often say at least something wrong, so do correct me. But um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And until we speak again, dear friends, Navarinaden Perimad Melonin. And farewell.